Okay, the recording is started. Okay, so uh, yeah, good afternoon to all of you. I will immediately now hand first of all over to Philip. Yeah, uh, wonderful that we can start. Sorry for those uh, technical difficulties. Uh, if I could please ask everyone again to mute your microphone. Anything that could uh, the flow of this, of course, it somehow have time. Can, can you hear him? Introduction. Um, I myself am Philip Crater. I am the CSO and Vice President of the Asian Region for our company, MCICLT. Uh, I am currently uh, living in The Hague uh, with frequent. Did a Bachelor in International Studies at the Leiden University. The, at Shanghai University. And in Hanoi, uh, my focus in our company is on all law and tax matters and facilitate. And became myself on the age of. scientific research, uh, but rather what we would want to present with this is a hand that guides you and uh, hopefully helps you if this is something that does interest you. Now, before uh, the presentation of business is Here is National Airport. the UAE in particular, uh, being, being a hub. And you can think back to this image because this is what we mean. <laughs> yes, please remember to keep your mics muted. Thank you very much. As a start, we will go through the UAE country profile. Now, what we've outlined here um, is, a, is a few important points. Uh, for example, the macro profile and some judicial systems um, and meant that a week ago
mute your microphone. We still seem to have people able to press. when we speak of the UAE uh, with uh, an area of 83,600 kilometers squared. Um, yeah, we're looking, we're looking at, a, at a nation that is rather small, as you can see, um, but looking at GDP, PPP, uh, what we do see is a force, uh, almost seven, uh, 750,000 billion uh, US dollars uh, which, as per 2019, uh, puts the UAE at a global rank of uh, 34 um, look per capita. This even increases to the sixth uh, yeah, country worldwide, according to World Bank uh, in 2019. Uh, what you will observe, and we will definitely get to the reason for that later, um, is that the unemployment rate is very low with 2.6%. Um, the FDI inflow is 10.4 billion US dollars, which in my opinion should increase over time, um, along with, with more attractive initiatives um, and industry settlement occurring. The currency is the dirham, um, which is actually pegged to the US dollar. Uh, this, we believe, is very relevant um, because especially, especially in its infancy, in, in, in the country's infancy, uh, this was a big advantage uh, for the, the country. But of course, um, in, in current times, uh, this, this may, may be not uh, We're getting echo again. <laughs> this, may, this may no longer be the best situation. And this is something that we will briefly explore later. Uh, lastly, for this macro overview, I would like to go over the uh, complexity index that the TMF group uh, completes every year. Um, what this index is, is it looks at, um, it looks at the most and least complex uh, jurisdictions for facilitating business. Um, and in, for example, in 2019, the UAE here ranked fourth, which is actually very bad. It means uh, it was very complex or it was seen as very complex to perform business uh, in the UAE in this time. However, in 2020, in the new updated TMF uh, index, what we saw is that the UAE actually improved to rank 53. Now, in the presentation, you will actually uh, yeah, likely be able to see why TMF Group has found that conducting business is um, less complex now, as it was, uh, say, a year ago. A lot of it has to do with uh, legislature that we will go over later. Now, for time constraints, I will skip most of the history part, just since we already had uh, these difficulties that kept us up. What I will say, however, is that um, the 2nd of November 2004 is a, a very notable year when we speak about this country that was uh, formed in 1971, uh, which is the sad demise of Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan. Um, the reason I do mention it is because he was seen as this, this father figure of the country. Um, people that were alive during uh, his time in, in, in position uh, would surely remember um, how the country was. And although things, I would say, didn't get worse or better, you can of course never say that, um, the death of this figure did definitely leave the country in awe. And back then when it did happen, the whole country essentially stood still for weeks. Uh, this is how much love there was for this person. Now let's move on to the socio profile. Um, what, we, what we realize here is that actually only 11.5% of the citizens uh, that are in the UAE, stand 2019, um, are UAE citizens or locals. Uh, the remaining 88.5% are actually expatriate workers. 
Um, you have a breakdown here of the, the expat structure. I will not go through it, but you can. Um, what I will mention is that India definitely serves as um, yeah, the country with the most populous uh, in the UAE with almost 40%. Um, we've included here an age permit to the right. Um, and what, what you can clearly see here is that the inhabitants of the UAE are mostly working age males. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a working and workers society. Now, there have been so-called emiratization initiatives. Um, these are initiatives to employ UAE nationals, as they are fewer, uh, in a meaningful and efficient manner, both in the public and the private sector. Um, in the private sector, this is, uh, yeah, it is becoming more successful. It is gaining wind. But the reason it is needed is that it is still lagging behind as of now. And uh, only about 0.35% of the private sector uh, is actually represented by UAE citizens. Now, the public sector has seen more better results uh, with, with most of them in government jobs. But this is something that the country has explicitly stated it would like to move away from. It wants to get them involved in more ways. Um, the working conditions for yeah, many expats, especially blue collar workers, uh, are quite hard. And although there is little to no worker protection, it's very important to mention here that as a country, the UAE has definitely addressed this in the recent years. Um, although you, you may have heard stories of passports being taken away and harsh living conditions, working in extreme heat for hours, skipping pay, um, the country itself is trying to address this. And there is something called the wage protection system, where actually companies have to pay out their, especially laborers, uh, via a third party to assure that these wages are paid. Um, sadly, the companies do still find a way around it. We don't need to go into how, um, but I think what is very important to note is that we are not talking here about a country that completely doesn't care. There are initiatives. Um, it is just that as of now, it is still lagging behind a little bit, but it is improving and it is actively uh, happening. Now, I will try to brush over the, econom uh, the economy profile also at uh, some speed. So uh, it is the second largest economy in the Middle East. Uh, the only one surpassing it here being Saudi Arabia. Uh, when we look at a global scale, uh, the UAE ranks in 24th. Uh, this is of course, again, uh, as per GDP per capita. Always uh, have to be careful with uh, rankings like this because of course, different measures will lead to different results. Uh, the UAE is part of quite a few uh, international uh, institutions and groups such as the UN, the IMF, uh, OPEC and others as listed. But one problem that we will also go into more detail later on is that the UAE is still heavily dependent uh, on oil and gas exploration, with the exception being Dubai, where only about 5% of the GDP uh, does come from oil and gas exploration. Um, overall, however, that picture is a bit different. For example, although this is an outdated uh, status, this does show you Mm, perhaps the severity of the issue, that is that in 2009, so 11 years ago, 85% uh, of the UAE economy was based on oil exports. Of course, this has changed, but uh, it is definitely a problem that still needs to be addressed. How it is being addressed is with really massive and tremendous diversification efforts. Um, for example, in yeah, sections such as trade, distribution, Tourism, which is one of the biggest non-oil sources of revenue. Uh, MICE, which is meetings, incentives, conferencing, and exhibitions. Uh, and also real estate. There's a, definitely a lot happening with, with real estate uh, in the UAE, especially in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, and lastly, with the diversification efforts uh, taking place in communication infrastructure and also technology. Something you will notice uh, in... <laughs> A lot, a lot of attention grabbing headlines 
is that whenever there's a technological advance, uh, be, be it flying taxis or a robot, anything, the UAE is at the forefront of exploring this. This is a, definitely a common threat. Now, it is also seen as one of the most open economies. Uh, so in the 2020 Index of Economic Freedom, it ranked 18th, just behind the USA. Uh, take it what you will for. And yeah, the UAE also has a very, very strong focus on both infra and urban structures. Uh, there's a really world leading road network, which you can probably best observe if you were to use um, Google Earth at nighttime and you will, you will just see all of the lights and basically connecting uh, all, all main parts uh, of this, this country. Um, there are four international airports, of course, uh, DXP being the most known one, but there are three others that uh, do participate in, in quite a bunch of international flights with, uh, you know, an, uh, an arsenal of, of uh, destinations. So they are to be reckoned with. Um, and yes, <laughs> I think something also very relevant for, for uh, infra and urban structures is the, the very high rankings in tower statistics. Now, the UAE and uh, Dubai in particular here is already among the strongest and most diversified hubs. Air, sea and road connectivity is really unmatched. Um, and although the <laughs> rail system is, I would say, in its embryo stadium. Um, what matters here is the, is the mindset. It's that the UAE uh, are complete visionaries in that regard, and they always aim for more. So some, some of the most known and tallest buildings in the world are located in the UAE. You have the Burj Khalifa, you have Yas Marina, the world, the Palm, and you know, I could go on. There are surely more that, that you've heard of and uh, that you could think of. Uh, to list them all would actually far surpass uh, the time we have for this lecture. So I will now pass on to Martin uh, to talk about the judicial system. Yes, um, let me try to bring you very briefly to the reigning law schools and also the judicial system, uh, which is taking place in that country. 1971, if you remember back when the country was founded or uh, established, the constitution determined the division into local and federal courts under the so-called Sharia law, uh, which is the law interpretation which is coming mainly from, from Egypt uh, in the Arab world. That's the established interpretation of law. And this division takes place with the Supreme Court in Abu Dhabi. Um, this underlying law school, which is practiced here in UAE, is very near to the French or continental law schools or rulings. A lot of this swapped over. Um, first exception is that the two emirates, Dubai and Ras al Khaimah, maintain their judicial system with the exclusion of the Supreme Court in Abu Dhabi. That means they have their three instances and after that a court procedure is finished. The financial free zones in the UAE, we come later to that, DIFC and ADGM established their own legislation and also their own judicial system up to own courts. There the law school is common law, procedures are in English language only. Uh, with the intention to give simply a more convenience to international investors and to have a more common regulated law structure within these free zones. Local and federal laws and courts are here in that free zones excluded. And meanwhile, various free zones are also ambitious to establish this in their own judicial executive. Maybe, mainly this happens in activities like the arbitration, but it goes up to first little courts also in other free zones. Another strong trend which we see since a couple of years is alternative dispute, dispute resolution. Um, like in nearly every country, people consider law procedure, a court procedures are taking very long time, cost lots of money, and dispute resolution or arbitration 
could be a solution to speed up the things. Now, what Philip said in the beginning, when he introduced the slide of this chapter, we come to the 7th of November, 2020, which is not even one week ago. Uh, there we faced out of the blue, very progressive law amendments, um, which are really remarkable regarding the panel code, the criminal law and inheritance law. Some people even say that is revolutionary. Uh, the topics I go through with you, please always consider UAE is a Muslim country. It's not California or Florida. So let's go quickly to the points which has been amended. Divorce for expatriates here in the country can now be held under, executed under the laws of the country where the marriage took place, before it was the country of the husband or of the man. Inheritance. Now there is a free selection of the applicable law. I personally, I could make my last will now as per German law or US law or whatsoever. It becomes more important in things my opinion at least, in aspects like harassment, assault, and honor crimes. Um, there is now an equal treatment of honor crimes. This was before not the case. So that means more protection of women's rights. The punishment for society judged sexual offenses, again, go back and think about it. It's a Muslim country here that is massively liberalized. The rape of minors, many appreciate that, or of someone with limited mental capacity is causing now as a verdict in the extremum a death penalty. And decency laws change from imprisonment when you are acting or behaving undecent, whatever that means. This change from imprisonment to financial fines in case of the first offense. For many, many expatriates and also for especially entrepreneurs, uh, that amendment regarding the cohabitation is really something extremely, I must say, revolutionary between unmarried couples or unrelated mixed sex flatmates. The cohabitation is now legal before it was a criminal offense. It was not very often followed and investigated, but it took place once someone made a complaint. Next aspect is that, oh, wait. So uh, next aspect is that the suicide itself and also attempt of suicide is decriminalized and favoring instead more the mental health support. <coughs> next aspect also good Samaritans, or as we always see them here, first aid helpers, I just take a quote out of the law text itself, the amendment, any person who is committed, committing an act out of good intention that may end up hurting that person will not be punished. Before it could happen to you that the family of a deceased person whom you tried, for example, after a uh, traffic accident to help and he died, unfortunately, that they sued you for blood money, uh, compensation, and that they even uh, started criminal cases against you. Alcohol consumption is also no longer a criminal offense if without, with or without a license, and the judicial procedures itself have been also very much eased. So now legal translators are mandatory to be available for defendants and witnesses at the courts since you must consider the court language in the mainland courts is, of course, Arabic. And last but not least, if you are a victim of a crime related to indecent acts, like sexual harassment and so on, and there is a court case, now is the publicity in that excluded. Okay. So let's next uh, talk about taxation very briefly. Um, the UAE is generally seen as a tax-free country. Uh, however, you may be aware that that is not 100%. Federal and corporate tax laws uh, do exist. Uh, however, with the exception of oil and gas, 
banks and insurances as well as telecommunication, they are not executed. And the reason why uh, many people will refer to the UAE as a tax-free country uh, is the fact that there are no federal or uh, Emirati personal income taxes. In uh, 2018, we, we did see the addition of uh, a 5% charge uh, VAT. Um, but again, this is in the, in the big sum uh, negligible because uh, since there is no personal income tax, overall, you know, you could still call it a tax-free country with an asterisk. Um, something notable is that the UAE has uh, increased uh, or is always working on increasing uh, its range of double taxation agreements uh, with the list now topping uh, 117 uh, countries as per last month. Um, and that there is very agile implementation of uh, international compliance standards, be they from US side, EU side, or even OECD uh, side. This is something that we will actually uh, talk about a bit more later. So let me skip over this point uh, and give it back to Martin, who will talk about the jurisdiction hypermarket in the UAE. Yes, now it's time to go shopping. We, we met the headline extra, jurisdiction hypermarket, to make you understand that is one of the very, very rare countries with a huge variety of general economic jurisdictions, means facilitation, grounds to set up a company. As you can see in the overview, mainland sectors, free trade zones, financial free zones, and offshore register. Um, in the following, I will refer mainly about mainland free trade zones and financial free zones, offshore register, you will find them later on as normally grayscaled. I don't know why it is here not grayscaled uh, than in the handout. The mainland sectors. Um, we need to understand that United Arab Emirates is, an, is a federation of seven independent or more semi-independent Emirates. So for the mainland registration and for the licensing, these seven Emirates maintain all their own individual departments of economic developments. The UA company law itself requires for capital-based companies that in the minimum 51% of the shares are owned by a UAE citizen. Exception for that are professional firms and branches which have not a share capital, but in that case, a national agent is required. This lift of this 5149 rule takes place meanwhile in some fields, mainly related to higher foreign direct investment. We have, that is a very important aspect, especially for entrepreneurs, we have for such corporations, capital-based corporations, no minimum capital requirement anymore. Earlier, this minimum capital requirement was uh, Proud 300,000 dirhams means 81,750 US dollar. Generally, the business activities in these departments of economic developments are regulated by a licensing system with the selection of activity codes. The rough segregation of license types is professional, commercial, industrial, and tourism. And the license renewal takes place annually. So every year a company needs to renew the license and pay also, of course, new license fees. Commercial and office space is in the mainland per se mandatory um, because the commercial space is also a parameter for the visa quota of the company, means for the number of people that company is able to employ because the work permit, of course, and also the residence permit is running via the company. Shared offices, for example, with more than one license, so means two companies or three companies in one shared office are prohibited. But on the other hand, actually we are in the process that the so-called virtual mainland license is becoming a trend where this mandatory office and commercial space is being eased a little bit. 
Very new is also the e-trader or trader or merchant license. Uh, it's new because it has been now opened also for expats. Before it was only for UAE and GCC nationals. And here we have a mainland license type where per se the 5149 rule is not existing. So it can be 100% owned also by an expat. The license focus is very clear on home, micro and small businesses. So they want to stimulate the establishment of smaller companies to lead them over into the SME sector. The limitation for experts is unfortunately licensing only of professional services. Uh, when you see in the last dot what normally these still mentioned UAE and GCC nation, nationals can do. It is e-commerce, social media trade, import and sales. This is still restricted for UAE and GCC nationals only. That is so far very roughly the mainland sector, which is the domestic company. What you see here now is leading over to, I would say one of the largest success models of this country. This is just a collage of just a handful of free trade zone logos. So we come now here to the free trade zones, um, which are being seen by many as the main driver for UAE's economic development and for the country's positioning as a global hub. We have actually more than 55 zero free trade zones in the UAE, which is quite a lot. As far as I am aware, there's no other country in the world which has got so many free trade zones within its territory. 1985 already, the first free trade zone has been incorporated or built up, which, is, which was Jebel Ali free zone in Dubai. And Jaftsa is still now also the largest, largest fenced free trade zone in the world, means with exit and entry controls because of the free trade zone and the so trading activities. Out of these 50 free zones, more than 50 free zones uh, in the UAE, more than 30 alone are located in the Emirate of Dubai. So Dubai is there really the absolute driver to establish every year at least two or three cluster free zones, themed free zones, specialized free zones. Okay, it goes up to examples uh, where you ask yourself, does it really make sense? We have now in Dubai also a separate free trade zone for the trade with used furniture, uh, where I myself doubt that this has got really international trade character. But nevertheless, they try to attract by that with this cluster strategy, also the clustering, for example, of startups and op entrepreneurs. Main incentives, very roughly, no import export customs fees. Um, there's an exemption from corporate and personal tax. In, whenever this will occur, occur in the free trade zones, there will be an exception. 100% foreign ownership for the independent entity, for the subsidiary and also for the branch. And that was one of the main aspects to establish these free trade zones, to come away from this 51 to 49. It is in most cases a semi-independent jurisdiction. They have their own rules and, and, and regulations and they offer most flexible solutions for the commercial space. It starts with flexi desk offices, goes via regular offices, warehouses, plots, up to uh, industrial areas and, 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 and fields. Um, the commercial space, this must be always seen, has to be taken inside the free trade zone. Because also here the visa or residency quota for my number of employees, how many people can I work with is de determined by the space size. Um, the general limitation to operate only inside the free trade zone, how that all started in the regulations, softens more and more. Actually, service activities can be rendered unlimited also in the mainland. Trade activities go traditionally via a distributor or a branch in the mainland. 
But there are also ambitions to define universal localization so that a free zone registered company can settle with, his, with its offices in the entire city territory or wherever they find it appropriate. Um, the licensing is here, like in the mainland, also aligned to different kinds of activities. We have trading, service finance, industrial license, also, of course, tourism license, which the free zones define under service. And what is relatively new since two years, we have so-called freelancer license where no entity is needed to be established, no company, no company registration, just the individually individual person gets a license as a freelancer. Also licenses here have to be renewed annually. So you see always we are free of tax in the UAE as Philip mentioned, but we are not free from fees because they are recurring and come back to us annually. Then we have a special free zone segment, which are the financial free zones. Uh, to save a little bit time, I just make it a little bit in details with Dubai International Financial Center. It is a good right of DIFC to get this attention because this is the older financial free zone. And parallel just to see, and you can see it parallelly, it's a little bit in com made in, put into comparison. Abu Dhabi has got also its financial free zone. DIFC has been established in 2002 and became operational in 2004. If you remember back, this was very, very near to 2008, where the financial crisis took place. It was UAE's first onshore financial center, and the start was really sluggish. In the first years, uh, we were always joking that DIFC stands for Dubai International Food Court, because restaurant and retail license, licenses were the majority of the licenses issued in DIFC instead of financial institutions. This changed over the years, and now you find a huge range of banks, financial institutions, service providers, insurances, funds, asset managers, and so on. And they have their independent regulator, the DFSA, with a very strict compliance regime to keep the financial center on a serious level. Uh, the jurisdiction, as I mentioned before, is independent under common law. And in the GFCI, GFCI is a global financial centers index, which is annually issued. And this is a relative, relative young ranking now, uh, September 2020. Um, globally, DIFC ranks on rank 17, went down in the rank and also in the rating in 2020. Uh, when you look over to Abu Dhabi global market, they rank much lower because they are younger, of course, uh, nearly uh, yeah, 10 years. Um, and in the ranking and in the rating, they have another development. Uh, this has got also to do with it that there is a bigger in-stream of new licenses and companies settling at the moment than it is in DIFC the case. Okay, 40 years zero tax on corporate income is also something which DIFC guarantees, which made it very attractive, especially for international banks to open up their at least representative offices or even branches. As I said before, offshore segment, you can find them in the handout. So I hand over to Philip again. Yes, next we will be talking, uh, yeah, about now, now that you have an overview uh, of the country and some aspects of it, I want to put together a SWOT. So looking at the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, but also the opportunities that may lay on the horizon um, and what could threaten the country's progress. We begin uh, with the strengths. Some of them have already been mentioned. Uh, definitely the, the infrastructure is a, is a great strength. Um, and I would say that the UAE has an excellently uh, developed infrastructure, also in regards to, to business and facilitation of business. Uh, here we have zero tax with the asterisks. Uh, I think we've, we've mentioned now plenty that there are no federal taxes. And even though there is a VAT, we, we, and also, uh, you know, there are fees, annual license fees whatsoever, we can still regard the UAE 
uh, as a quote unquote tax oasis. Um, a very important aspect when we talk about the UAE and its strengths is this hub geography that I uh, mentioned actually right before we started uh, the presentation. So try to remember again the destination map uh, of Emirates Airlines that we showed you. And it just shows you how unmatched uh, this geography, this, this hub geography is. Um, it is, so to say, the center of the globe, and it makes excellent use of that. Um, and, uh, you know, this disadvantage could be unused, but they are finding the right ways uh, with their airport systems uh, to, to explore that uh, in, in the best way possible. Um, yeah, another, another strength that I would say is definitely the geopolitical stability uh, in the UAE. Now, the UAE lays within a region um, that is, uh, you know, more turbulent, uh, but the UAE can definitely be seen uh, as this solid rocks that, that lets these waves of turbulence uh, of its neighbors just splash off it. Uh, this definitely is a strength. Um, next, we have oil reserves. Now, <clears throat> um, paired with the fact that oil will, yeah, it, it's not likely to lose its relevance anytime soon. Uh, having, having the oil reserves that the UAE does uh, is definitely a strength and does put them up uh, in, in, a, in a good position. Uh, lastly, I've listed tourism. Um, now here we mainly speak about Dubai, but also increasingly about Abu Dhabi. Um, they, they really, there is no other way to put it, but they are the tourist destination to be. Uh, that's where you want to go. There is a lot of attractions, a lot of great hotels. You have entertainment options, uh, as well as, you know, a, a rich facet of the biggest malls imaginable where you can really just shop on end. Of course, uh, if there are strengths, there are also very likely weaknesses. And uh, that is no different in the UAE. Uh, the first major weakness I see is the bureaucratic inconsistencies. Um, so we've already somehow hinted at the uh, reforms from the 7th uh, November coming out of the blue. And this is a trend that you can actually observe uh, throughout history in the UAE. Um, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a mix between ambition uh, as well as external pressure um, that regulatory changes essentially occur overnight. Um, and keeping this in mind that from a business perspective, this does pose a possible hazard. This is dangerous. Um, this links very well with the partial untransparent regulation. Uh, so what I mean here is uh, as things seem to get decided on the fly, not even the responsible government agency uh, is, is often ready. They are sometimes left in the dark on how to you know, process requirements or to handle information requests. Um, I think a, a very good example is a very spontaneous introduction uh, of the UBO register just yeah, about four weeks ago now. Um, so what happened here was that 60 days before, uh, there was just suddenly a cabinet resolution that said, yeah, in 60 days from now, uh, every business will require a UBO register. Uh, if you then tried to get in touch with the responsible agency, you know, they, they basically gave you the information that they were not aware of anything. So as a business owner, you can sometimes feel quite lost. Now, again, this is something uh, that, that they are looking to address. Uh, there is more and more, um, you know, guidelines being put in place. But as of now, I do see this as quite a weakness of the country as a whole and of facilitating business in this country. The next weakness uh, listed is that they are not a member of the Hague Protocol. And the Hague Protocol or the Hague Agreement uh, is for business facilitation, the global standard for ease. So what happens is if you need to legalize or prepare documents, uh, members of the Hague Protocol have it very easy, whereas with the UAE not being a member of said agreement, uh, you would need an apostille, a super legalization. And if this then happens for you know, different sets of documents, 
uh, we're not only talking about a very long and daunting progress, uh, process, it's also relatively costly uh, compared to this global standard. So as a business owner, especially you know, dealing, dealing with anything international, uh, it may be extra work and uh, that may be a hassle you know, compared to, to other uh, destinations. Now, the next weakness is an over-dependence on a few sectors. Just on the same slide in strength, we've mentioned oil and tourism as being strength of the country. But on the flip side, even though this is a strength, uh, it does pose a weakness in the country as a whole that it is over-dependent on these few sectors. Because you know, what happens is that if one of those sectors were to collapse, uh, like we saw you know, currently, the tourism industry is quite hurt uh, from the pandemic that we are in. This can really, you know, this can really rip apart a, an entire pillar of what the country is standing on. Uh, with less support, there come more problems. So even though there are diversification efforts, um, the UAE definitely needs to, you know, it needs to keep in mind that currently it rests on these few sectors that, you know, quote unquote, run the show. And uh, that's why further diversification definitely has to happen. Now, the last weakness uh, listed is the desert climate. Uh, it, it may seem silly, but this can, especially in summer, this can really be unbearable. Anyone that, that has ever you know, been to the UAE or lived in the UAE in summer uh, would know that even though ACs exist essentially everywhere, uh, it adds complications both to carrying out business, but also just to your day-to-day -day life, which as a business owner is also relevant. Moving on to opportunities and threats. Um, I think everyone is aware that the two strongest emerging markets of the future are Asia and Africa. Uh, with the UAE and its you know, geographic hub that we've already explained uh, in the strength, um, it's, it's very convenient uh, to have facility towards these two markets. Now, in, in many senses, these two markets are already the emerging markets, but I personally see this as only increasing over time. So, you know, it, it's very important that there is this excellent connectivity that there is. And I believe that actually uh, Dubai uh, or D DXP specifically is the only airport um, that flies towards every capital in Africa directly. So they're, they're unmatched uh, in, in that regard. The next opportunity is uh, the access to new markets. So with, with changes going on, and th there are quite a few changes uh, in this presentation um, that are things that happened within a month from, from today. Um, so insofar closed markets, uh, such as the Israeli market, are opening up through, in this case, the Abraham Agreement. Um, and what this does is really, it just, you know, it, it brings an influx of business to both of these nations. Uh, this I definitely see as an opportunity, um, especially in the short and medium term, but also in the long term. There, you know, nothing, nothing indicates that this could not be beneficial also in the long term. Now, the big opportunity, uh, the, the, the last two being the biggest perhaps, um, I see in accelerated diversification. So we've all heard and we've seen some statistics of how the UAE has performed and um, you know, also earlier presented in the, in the economic profile, uh, there is increasing diversification to, to hedge their bets against what is looming, which is the oil and tourism industry uh, you know, running the show, being in the majority sector. If you think that the UAE is performing well now, imagine what they could be performing at in a few years with these diversification efforts going on and if they no longer rest on tourism and oil. So what we've seen, especially with uh, COVID-19, for example, is that you know, it, it, it hurt industries like the tourism industry quite bad. But now imagine if the country as a whole was no longer dependent on this. It would then you know, 
almost leave it scatheless. It, it would not really impact it. That for me is a, is a big opportunity. Uh, and lastly, I've already spoken about this earlier, are the technological advances. Um, in the UAE, these are adapted very, very quickly at rapid pace. You may have heard of robot police, flying drone taxis, and, and so forth. You know, all, all, of these, all of these crazy futuristic things. And even though, you know, some of them are more wishful thinking than reality for now, I think what is important to take away here is this mentality the mentality to lead the charge in terms of adoption of such technologies uh, and the mentality to keep pushing uh, in this sense you could really say that the uae and its its leadership uh, are technological visionaries and to me in the 21st century that is really you know one one of the big one of the biggest opportunities you could have a leadership that understands where the future lays and what to focus on, because this means that in the future, they will be ready for whatever is coming. Now, at the same time, there are, of course, a number of threats. I've already mentioned briefly COVID-19, a global pandemic. You know, what do you do if this happens? Uh, this has definitely exposed how frail the economy is, not just in the UAE, but actually on a global scale. Uh, I don't think we could have ever imagined how easily in today's day and age, things could turn into dust. Suddenly we have entire countries standing still. And you know, this is no different in the UAE. They have faced issues. There has been loss of investment due to it. And there have been so many other problems. Um, so this definitely is a threat. And you know, although we could at length uh, discuss in detail the response to, to, this, uh, to this threat and to global pandemics in general, um, something to definitely keep in mind is that whether the response this time was good or bad, it is important to respond well to these and to look ahead and be ready for the worst to come. And I think many countries, including the UAE at the time, were not ready. And that is a big threat. Now, the next point is loss of investments. Um, yeah, if, if, you, if you think about it, a, a destination that lives off of this high society and high volume uh, of, of, of turnover, uh, when suddenly this shine is missing, when suddenly something like a pandemic disrupts this, um, foreign investment can go missing. Construction projects can get canceled. Sponsorships could no longer be happening. You could see a delay of the Expo 2020. All of these things uh, are threats and they definitely do tie in you know, with, the, with the grander picture. It's, it's not uh, you know, that the UAE did bad with this uh, exclusively. It is a problem on a global scale, but it does directly uh, apply here. Now, the next threat is that other hubs could be developing globally. Uh, we've mentioned how the connectivity in the UAE is currently unmatched. Um, but with that, as time goes, what you will see is that other options are slowly emerging. Uh, even though they may not be ready, they may not be ready now, they may not be ready for many years to come. Uh, it is only a matter of time until there will be that key decision that the UAE has to make. Otherwise, it may be dethroned in that aspect. So adaptation, again, is key. Thinking ahead is key. Going with the times is very important because, again, you know, every superpower can fall. And just like that, uh, even though they, they are at a very good position here, uh, take a few years of bad decisions matched with a few years of very right decisions in a different hub. And suddenly we're talking about a different situation. And this is definitely a threat to keep in mind. Talk about the last threats very briefly uh, for, for time constraints. Climate change, I've, I've mentioned the desert climate as a weakness. Uh, now imagine everything that I said, but make it worse. That's basically the threat that is, uh, that is looming. Uh, you may have certain production chains uh, that will not be realizable in an efficient manner and therefore they may be taken elsewhere. Um, but you know, also in general for, for business owners, the situation may be even more unbearable. The last uh, threat is this pegging to the US dollar. I said how in the infancy of the country, this was definitely a strength and it was a boost for it. 
Um, but currently the economic future of the US and many countries is uncertain. So we reach a time where being pegged to the US dollar, it may actually cause more harm than good. Of course, this is uh, something that time will tell, but it is definitely a threat to keep in mind to in general be pegged to another currency. Now we will uh, talk about startup support and the question, you know, does it exist? We'll look through government initiatives, some incubators and accelerators. We have skipped the support from banks, but you can look at it later on. Uh, and briefly the private equity venture cap and funds model. Now to government initiatives, it is to say uh, that there, there are, for example, you know, some features. Uh, there is, for example, the 100% foreign ownership that was uh, mentioned by Martin in the hypermarket. Uh, in the mainland, this is very partial, but it is increasing. Um, but they do have this rich network of free zones, the offshore register that you can uh, review in your own time in the slides later. Um, sorry, mute yourself again. Thank you. Um, yeah. So here we're talking about being sponsor free in over 125 business areas. What this usually comes with is investing uh, more than 1 million US dollar. Uh, in various sectors, this could, this could actually go up to about 20 million. Uh, the next initiative is the modification of the visa or residency. There used to, be, used to be this saying that you are a permanent guest in the UAE, but speaking more timely, there is a five-year, a 10-year visa, as well as a permanent residency, uh, the option to obtain a golden visa, um, all the way up to naturalization. Now, just to give some numbers, uh, for this five-year visa, for example, you would have to invest 1.36 million US dollars uh, equivalent. For the 10-year visa, uh, even 2.725 million. Um, and then if we move up, a step further to the golden visa. Um, for example, a perk is that you could be six months out of the country, keep your residence, no problem. Um, SME support in public projects is definitely something that I would say is in its infancy. Um, for example, the, the allocation of contract volume uh, was only 5%, which amounted to, to $110 uh, million uh, in, in Dubai. Um, but what we then saw, for example, with the Expo 2020 contract volume is that the allocation was increased to far bigger than this number of 5%. However, what was oh. also a uh, main perk was shorter payment terms with 30 instead of days, for example. Um, however, it is quite hard to track everything back because uh, due to the postponement of the expo, uh, there is quite a, a payment backlog. Um, and again, things are in its infancy, but small changes like the Dubai Startup Hub uh, run by the Ministry uh, of Commerce, having a 263% year on year growth really just shows that, you know, there is a push for these things. These initiatives, although they are just starting out, they are being actively pushed um, and they are actively being propelled forward. Now, the next slide uh, on initiatives, I want to talk more about, yeah, technology. I've spoken about how there are intense efforts towards technology. Um, and something, something that shows this further is that actually the UAE is the first country in which we have a ministry of artificial intelligence. That's now the AI ministry. Um, and this again leads back to the point really of the, the country having this vision to perform a metamorphosis from this oil exporting country in the desert to a tech hub. And I think in many ways it has achieved being that tech hub and how it achieved that is the constant rollout of smart initiatives, both G2C and G2G. Uh, for example, the UAE is also, as well as uh, having this AI ministry, the first country uh, with its own ministry of happiness. 
So you will be driving down the road and suddenly, uh, you know, to your left, you, you will see a, a big smiley face in a circumference of about eight meters on a government building. You think, yeah, this is, uh, this is the ministry of happiness. What they have been doing is leveraging uh, of technologies, mainly in, in regards to blockchain and AI. Uh, but there are also, you know, these, these grand ideas of Dubai being a paperless city starting uh, already in the next year. Overall, whether we agree uh, or disagree that it is a, a tech hub, what I will say is that undoubtedly the processes are lean, fast and cheap. If you do want to uh, review their strategy in that regard, uh, I've attached the, the link here in the slides, which you can then um, you know, check later. Uh, but I think something that is to mention, regardless of all of this technological drive and wanting to have everything done digital, they will always, funnily enough, find a way uh, to make you come to their office for whatever reason. Sometimes there is no reason, but uh, I think some habits just don't die out. Now, talking about incubators and accelerators, um, we've mentioned at length that there is a strong focus on technology, but what we need to keep in mind uh, also is that there is some sort of buzzword addiction going on. So just like in the dot-com bubble with everything suddenly having a dot-com attachment, uh, what we see in the UAE is this overuse of, of these tech buzzwords like AI, autonomous, 3D, blockchain, and so on. I'm sure you can uh, think of more. Uh, there has been a focus on, on embedding technology as a whole in, in these emiratization policies. Um, so there are initiatives to bring uh, young Emiratis away from these government jobs in the public sector into entrepreneurship, into, you know, finding ways to get them involved in startups, uh, into, you know, raising businesses and, and driving, you know, driving the country's progress from within. The exception here is where, where tech is seen as coming from abroad. They really want to push this internal aspect. I've uh, listed some big players in the sovereign funds, uh, but I will, I will skip through their values and uh, explanations. Just do note here that it's primarily not for startups. <laughs> you may uh, think of that as, as you uh, will. I don't know the right uh, strategy to go forth, um, but time will tell. Now on the next slide, uh, we see several incubators and accelerators. Um, this is a this is a topic. so if this is a topic that does interest you after the presentation you know you can you can click through and you can see what each of them are doing uh, obviously we do not have time to go through them uh, yeah for for this presentation um, but they are there if it does interest you you can look at it later on and I pass over to Martin for the private equity yes a section. Private equity venture capital funds is also briefly to describe because we are talking here about a relative young, small and clear segment. We have actually in the United Arab Emirates 84 VC and PE firms, angel groups, micro VCs and syndicates, plus 35 funds which are active in the entire country, which are also active, of course, overseas and internationally. But this you see mostly more uh, as an activity of the sovereign funds. We all know that, that, this, that the general from the GCC region, the sovereign funds are active internationally in, a, in an enormous way and in enormous engagement. Um, with regards to tech startup funding, you can see here the 2018 and 2019 figures, which are a little bit uh, describing again uh, that it is young, that it is uh, not on a mature level till now. 2018, we had $319 million distributed on 110 tech startup deals. And 2019, it was less money, which has been distributed more or less to the same amount of deals. So it means each and every project 
did get a lower funding than it was in the year before. Under the top 10 active investors, this shows also uh, that it is a young market, are alone five sovereign funds or government owned free zones or their separate accelerators. We had them, some of them on the list before. Uh, just to name a few, Mubadala, ICD, Flat6 Labs, 2454. Um, again, you can see this later in the handout and go through it uh, in this list of incubators and accelerators where we provided also the web links. Many established business conglomerates in UAE means local companies grown over decades, uh, usually also owned by Emirati families. They are also active as an investor, first and foremost in their own business activities and then the outgoing international relations. And they don't go much public with that or promote that. Um, so that is also a very important, I would say, private equity source, uh, which needs to be seen in addition to the numbers given before. The next is a very, very rough run with the back in your hand, facilitation, how to start such a business. We will go through uh, what we recommend and what we see as important through the evaluation of the different jurisdictions and then the final selection. We give you a very, very rough overview about incorporation and structural cost frames. Administration procedures we will show up and the last two points, pitfalls and setup helpers due to lack of time, we grade out and but keep it in the handout so that you can read after that through these topics. The jurisdiction evaluation and selection starts uh, definitely that you judge the jurisdiction category which you need for the setup of a, of a company by your market approach. The market approach can be either your own focus on the mainland or the domestic market where obviously a mainland setup is recommendable. When you focus on overseas markets, we have go back to the topic free zones, a huge variety of free zone setups which are available from where you can distribute your products all over the world. When your focus is on both, there is this traditional combination of a free zone entity in combination with a mainland distributor who takes over to serve the domestic market. In your go if you go on things like conveying intellectual property commission business where you just write invoices because you are dealing bringing party a and party b together and charge a commission then could be an offshore setup the right jurisdiction category second point is then of course to localize the jurisdiction candidate to to make a list of candidates and to look first of all, on the cluster focus of the jurisdictions. For example, Dubai has got a free zone which is called Internet City, Media City. There are different cluster or thematic focusings where you can automatically expect that also the authorities or company neighbors have got the same approach like you. Uh, also important are always the operational jurisdiction features. How easy is it to go through processes with them and so on. Then, of course, geographical preferences within the country play a role. What is, for example, with the distance between your own place of living and the workplace? It could be, especially in the rush hour, sometimes a factor which, is cost, which costs you when you made the wrong decision one or one and a half hours of working time. Last but not least, the pricing of the structural cost, the cost of the residency, this all should play a role. <clears throat> and leads then to the point that you can perform a feasibility about your jurisdiction candidates. Let's say you found four jurisdiction candidates then go, if it goes into a little bit production or assembling, go and check the cost parameters like rent, electricity, water, gas can be very different. 
check the communication quality. That is especially for <clears throat> entrepreneurs in the tech field, very important. Uh, which provider is where available? How is the bandwidth going on? And so on. Then the connectivity of your individual or public transportation to that place, the ease of administration processes to set up the entity. And last but not least, we always recommend visit these jurisdiction candidates like a free zone or like the mainland economic department to get a look and feel. And in addition to that, you should always make a cross check for your result matrix. You have a result matrix of your candidates and then you can easily consult the jurisdiction administration. Many of them have a one stop shop or red tape. Red tape is nothing negative here. We see it in a different way. They maintain dialogue centers where you can talk, discuss with the people uh, with, a tea or, with, with, with a cup of tea or coffee. Uh, you can also open up in already established offices of companies. Ask them, how is your experience here? What are the pros? What are the cons? Where do they talk too much marketing gibberish? And where is it really as it is also described on their websites? And you can also consult business helpers, advisors or law firms about their experience. And the point five is then in this jurisdiction evaluation and selection, the point decide. Just a rough overview about cost frames. Uh, I would say, look into it in the handout more in details. We just sorted here a little bit for the better comparison. Set up and structural cost only means operational parameters, like how, many, how much stuff do I need? Uh, what is my office equipment and so on? Um, they vary for each business case anyways. Professional fees for helpers are also not reflected. So these are the so-called do-it-yourself structural and incorporation costs. Auditing fees, ESR, and other corporate compliance charges are also not reflected simply because it's depending from business to business. The administration procedures are different sometimes, but they have a similar workflow, which goes from pre and company trade name approval uh, to signing the attesta and attestation of incorporation docs, registration of the entity, <laughs> delivery of corporate documents, and then the follow-up for contracting. I yeah. lead over and, to Philip. Uh, this puts us actually on uh, yeah our last slide. It's uh, some sort of conclusion slash we've called it here critical pathways. Um, with the first point being ambition as a downfall. I've already mentioned uh, at length how ambitious and driven the, the leadership uh, in the UAE is. And what made the UAE surge seemingly out of nothing into, into a destination that, uh, you know, when we, when we read about it strikes us as this hyper-modern and developed uh, state is in fact ambition. So the leaders always had this one thing in common. They reached for the stars and once they got there, they kept going. They were, never, they were never satisfied, they were always hungry and there was always this drive for more. Uh, they're trying their best to always be at the forefront of things like technological development, smart solutions, and just in general have this really strong vision. All in all, I think this is positive because ambition does drive progress. Uh, however, we also need to watch the flip side and that is the critical aspect of it. It's that most grand claims can lead to the biggest downfalls. So many critics of uh, the UAE are already viewing it and especially Dubai uh, as the place that wants to do everything but achieves very little. And you know, this is because the expectations are very high because according to me, who is very critical of the UAE, they are definitely not a place that achieves little. They do achieve a lot. But what gets in their own way is, you know, these high expectations set by their own ambition. Now, if you make these, these very, very big claims and you don't follow them up, uh, that is a problem. 
And this can actually severely damage uh, the image for you know, investors, tourism, and so on in the long run. I think a, a great anecdote here is uh, about last year uh, in, in June or so, when I was uh, in, in Dubai, um, just shopping uh, at, a, at a mall, and I was uh, myself offered to purchase property in the new project uh, Dubai Creek Tower. Um, the promise here from the company that, uh, that facilitates this were huge. You know, it will be done in 2020 and it will be the biggest project and, you know, everything. So e even though I kept checking and I said, are you sure that this is going to be done in 2020? They assured me, yes, it will. So what's the situation now? The project is frozen. And even without a global pandemic going on, I'm very, very certain that it would not be completed because this project that was started in, I think, 2016, you know, was nowhere near completed uh, back in summer 2019. But the drive was there, you know, this, this pushing was there. They were like, yeah, we, we will finish it. Of course we will. They have this vision and uh, it, it's a strength, but it can definitely, you know, be, be a critical aspect where if, if they do this too much, it can go wrong. Now, the next point is over-regulation. And uh, in particular, this, this complex horizon of regulation that is going on. Uh, business in the UAE, we've learned that, has a lot of attractive perks. Uh, from taxation to the geolocation, the free zone perks, uh, they're essentially endless. It is definitely a top destination for business. But we do, we do have to be very clear with that. A part of this is the loose regulation. So while, for example, a 5% VAT introduction isn't necessarily a reason to you know, shy away to the U, uh, from the UAE as an investor on its own, what I think business owners may fear is what comes next. You know, um, changes such as the economic substance regulation in April or the UBO register in October, they were introduced just like that at the snap of a finger. And this really creates unrest in both business and investors. Um, they do have to make sure that they get this right, that they have the right finesse with regulation because I am someone that believes that regulation is important, but in that regard, I'm also a huge proponent of, you know, being transparent, making sure that you inform everyone. And especially as a business owner, this is very important so that you can be sure that you know, everything is still right, that you are, you know, secure and that you have a, that you have a hand to lean on in case something goes wrong. This is definitely something they do need to keep in mind. The next point is the development of other regional hubs. So we've spoken at length about the connectivity of the UAE and how the infrastructure can hardly be beat. But another threat is, you know, what, what if these regional hubs that it aims to reach develop to the point where the need of having an easy access point will diminish over time. Again, it would take years to set up this uh, at, the, at the extent of even you know, running half as smooth as some operations uh, in the UAE, like for example, the DXB airport. Uh, but I do think it is, a, it is definitely a looming threat and it needs to be addressed in the right way in order to be ahead. Now, the last point uh, that I definitely want to close with is the readjustment to the new normal. Um, like I mentioned, just like every other country, uh, the UAE was hit by this pandemic and it will need to find ideal ways to adapt uh, to changes, both in healthcare aspects, but also eventual shifts in human interactions or even cultures which come from this pandemic. You know, how can you be the most effective post-COVID society? For example, the trader's license is already a good step in the right direction. We're boosting options for digital SMEs. Uh, we're pushing people to utilize the online space and social media for work. Um, but there will definitely be further impact uh, of COVID and there will be a huge drive to adopt more technologies and shift away from this traditional, you know, meetings and incentives uh, program uh, towards online business conducting, towards, you know, such online platforms like right now, me giving you this, uh, 
this small lecture in, in, an, in an online space instead of standing in front of you at a pult and talking. These are all changes that are happening as we speak. And going with the digital developments is going to be really the deciding factor between the UAE in 20 years, 30 years from now, being seen as a success story or just another flaw. If they are ready to weather the storm, this critical pathway could actually turn out to be the key factor, the, the, the main key factor uh, in future growth and success. But if this is handled wrongly, it could just as well be the downturn and it could really be left in the dust. I think this is the, the most important uh, pathway and this is why I'm ending on it because it may not seem that critical, but as these developments are being made right now, how they are reacting to it now in order to impact the future is definitely the most important aspect yeah, of reaching success. And with that, we're at the end of our lecture. Um, I don't know, Hans, how it is with, uh, with the timing, uh, if we do have time for a question and answer, but if not, then you're definitely more than welcome uh, to reach out. We've uh, left some information here. You can, of course, take it down now or, uh, you know, take it from the handouts later. We're definitely always open for, for any questions, especially the practical ones, uh, if there is anything that you require. So, we are here all definitely ready for questions or discussions regarding different points. We tried to show during the last nearly one and a half hours as a rough overview about the country. Maybe Hans, uh, you tell us how can we go on because we are not familiar with it, how you do it in your students group, how to do the Q&A. There's no Hans. <laughs> Does anyone have questions or annotations? Yes, Martin. Uh, how are you? And thank you for this wonderful presentation. Oh, Khaled. Nice to see oh, you, nice my friend. You. <laughs> yes. My question is, uh, after this, uh, in this uh, new era, the post-pandemic uh, era, what do you think is the most uh, sector that will be affected negatively? And what is the most promising sector in UAE? Uh, in UAE, especially, or maybe also generalized? Uh, as you wish, uh, both like uh, UAE and in general. <laughs> Yes, if I would have a 100% clear answer on that question, um, I would get a prize for that or something and would not, would not sit here. I personally guess the most affected sector post-pandemic, uh, first of all, we have to reach a post-pandemic situation. And if we look around, actually this second wave, especially going over Europe, uh, does not show us show us that the post pandemic status is very near that 's my my first guess. Uh, I strongly believe we have to live with that pandemic or at least with that virus nevertheless post pandemic most uh, affected industry will be i guess definitely the airline industry uh, which we already see now already very, very clear because uh, we have on the one side a sh massive shrinking of the fleets, uh, also a massive brain drain by just being forced as airlines uh, to set free so many people. And in future, we will not know exactly how to get them all back because they may defund in other business sectors. Uh, the tourism industry, which is for us here, especially in the Emirate of Dubai, a very, very important factor, 
seems to be also with new concepts uh, very resistant to two massive downturns, let's say it in that way. We saw, we see here many new hygienic concepts, also new arrangement concepts, how to market a hotel, for example, how to market a beach resort under completely changed conditions and in a completely other and different situation. I hope that gave a little bit an answer, Khaled. <laughs> Yes, it did. But also the other part of the question is what's the most promising sectors to focus on? It will the be most, influenced in a positive way. The most promising sectors are, in my opinion, anyways, even without uh, such a pandemic, especially here in the UAE, is the tech sector itself. Uh, simply also because of the massive, massive initiatives and efforts of the government and also, on the other hand, of many, many companies, bigger companies, to stimulate here an entrepreneurial scenario on the one side, uh, to develop startup culture and to accelerate that to higher levels. Any other question from your side, guys, or here in class? Hi, Mr. Martin. Yes. Hi, Mr. Martin. Hello, Uma. Hello, Uma. Sir. Nice to see you. Uh, hi, hi, sir. I, I'm grateful, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I'm in immigration and student consultancy business. Uh, can you uh, put a light on it? How can we work on it after this pandemic? Uh, you mean with uh, more or less marketing universities, marketing education opportunities for students, or what, what is the question? Uh, student and uh, immigration consultant, pe the people who are skilled and uh, businessmen who uh, want to migrate to Canada, Australia, America, and wherever they want to go. Okay. Uh, that, that's what, what is the market and the student market as well. Yeah, what, what we saw in the, in the last months is that uh, this interaction and, and this transactions, especially of experts and students, are massively, of course, have been limited by the, by the entrance policy or entry policy of uh, several countries. Uh, this I guess will take time till this will change. Yeah, uh, with regards to the United Arab Emirates, we have here, for example, in the education sector, in the higher education sector, the situation we have a huge amount of international universities which maintain here a UAE <laughs> campus, very, very often in Dubai, and they also depend from that transition that the student says, okay, I make, for example, my first one or two years, one or two years or semesters, I make it in that campus in Dubai to switch then over to the main university over in the States and so on. This all is lying down at the moment. And what we see, what makes me personally also a big worry, um, I think the, the largest victims of this uh, pandemic are people who are actually in whatever level of education because they are limited totally to these online platforms. They, are, they also cannot move around. They cannot participate in exchange programs. <laughs> So let me ask you, um, I start a company in Thailand and I want to go abroad. Does it make sense to create an offshore uh, company? You are a registered agent for special economic zone. Of course, you are only locating and relocating tax money, I'm sure. Uh, so my question is, uh, does it make sense to, uh, to start an offshore company? And, and if, what is the right location for it? Um, 
I would, I would first strike out of the discussion the word offshore because this is misleading. We have, uh, we mentioned that we have special offshore registers which are more for, let's say, a kind of virtual business, for example, for the management of intellectual property, but also for wealth management. Um, the question, if it makes sense to, to facilitate with a known entity uh, in the United Arab Emirates as an existing company or as an entrepreneur located in Thailand is first and foremost defined by your market approach. Um, Philip mentioned it very clearly with this map, with this network map of, of Emirates Airlines. Um, we have here the hub functionality which gives us the opportunity to reach from here really all destinations in Europe, Asia, and Africa. So if the market approach has got this international character, then the clear answer is yes, it makes sense. Okay. So if there are not any other burning questions as due to our mistake here at Stanford or our connectivity here, um, we are already 10 minutes over time, right, of your valuable time. And I think what we are doing here, we connect with each other. I'm very happy to have the Stanford students here from uh, Thailand and from many other countries, as Stanford is very international. 45% of our students are Thai, half of them from family business background. 15% are half Thai, Luke Kring, and 45% of the students at Stanford are from 100, more than 100 countries right now. That makes Stanford the most international university in Thailand. And with IBA, our guests, Assalamu alaikum again, uh, from Pakistan, we have an outstanding entrepreneurship business school uh, here with us, providing the IBA OEP online program where uh, IBA was kind to give us an opportunity, the students from the class uh, change management uh, to partake. So what does it mean? You guys from Pakistan here on the screen, you will meet us again, <laughs> the students again, and we are happy to meet you again. My personal take is, it is amazing if uh, someone starts a company like Martin Crater and takes this company international. It's even more amazing that Philip is stepping in. He is in your situation or in your situation where you will soon to be. And I think this is an example of what it means when two generations are driving change. So what we heard was lean, fast, cheap. I think this is the mantra for us here at Stanford and it should be. Also, thinking about complex horizons of regulations, <coughs> Philip mentioned uh, you need to regulate, but you have to be careful to overregulate. And last but not least, the mantra which I take is, and I hope you join in with me online, the mantra I take is, Philip, you said they reach for the stars, and when they get there, they carry on. So that's what the mantra for us is, to reach for the stars, and when we get there, to carry on. So thank you very much again, Martin and Philip, for giving your very valuable time to Stanford International University, Thailand, and to IBA, Institute of Business Administration in Pakistan. Inshallah, um, we are very thankful and we wish you a great evening and a great weekend to come. Happy to meet, sorry to part, and happy to meet again. Sabadikap from Bangkok. Sabadikap, thank you very much. <laughs>
Hello, Mr. Martin. Hello. Yes, come on. Yes. Yes. I have a question. Uh, I have been to Dubai and I've um, roamed around Dubai quite a lot. But I feel that uh, it's not joke. It is going to get. It is, it is choking. Don't you think? What do you it's mean? It's getting choked. I mean, there's mean too much of uh, too much of things going on there, and uh, you hardly find any space uh, kind of thing to really start off. Everything seems there too much. Yes, maybe that's the first impression, but this is, this is exactly what Philip mentioned. This is this ambition-driven uh, situation where, of course, uh, you cannot coordinate it centralized. So you have many, many activities also a multiple time existing. And okay, uh, more can such a location not do than giving you a wide, wide selection of different opportunities and sometimes it's it's overwhelming yeah. yes yeah you, you may be right but uh, i think uh, at my age i'm not an over 69 68 69 uh, i don't I do have much time to really start off and do something or i need something which is uh, not that big but something to really uh, uh, utilize my time for for what is whatever is left of it I can understand that, but, but uh, on the other hand, of course, the Maxime, which is defining or which is driving Dubai, is, is, is uh, going into a wide audience which, with requirements which are, <clears throat> in most of the cases, more mid and long term oriented, of course. Yeah, mm. but I think that is everywhere the case. I mean, if you go now, for example, let's say, go to Shanghai Pudong, yeah, where the financial industry is being built up and so on. This is all they're running with an over, over offering of opportunities and with a high, high speed. Yeah? So that, I think that's normal. Quite maybe. Uh, but with the Gwadar city coming up, uh, I would take that that uh, that if that uh, hub uh, develops, that is going to take a lot of pressure off Dubai. What do you think? You, I didn't understand it. With the uh, with the Gawadar, Gawadar, you know, in Pakistan, yeah. the Gawadar city, of Pakistan, that is that is coming up. That is going to be a one big hub. But with the coming with uh, uh, that hub, that should be able to take a lot of uh, pressure off uh, Dubai. It could happen. I mean, we have, we have it also, we had it also in, in, in our lecture that of course the development of other regional hubs needs to be considered and it's, it's a competition between hubs. Uh, yeah. It could be <clears throat> that active people are wondering, are, are running away a little bit from Dubai, but instead of that, others will come. I mean, we have this here, we have here a transient, transient country. This needs to be seen all the time uh, when you go back in the population structure just uh, roughly 12 percent of the population here are local citizens the rest are expatriates yeah? True. so right. and this this implicates automatically a transient character we had it after the financial crisis that many people left the country uh, we had it also now uh, 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 in the beginning of the year when the, uh, when the pandemic came up, when co companies did break together, could not employ their people anymore, that many people left, but other people on the other side are coming. Yeah? That is always a coming and going. I think that is, a, that is a normal character of a virulent and active destination, like it is in Dubai. Mm, right. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So that was it. Otherwise, we keep you for a long time, Martin and Philip, right? So I would say, uh, I think... Hans, we sit, we sit anyways at the desks and uh, yeah. start with so, a little bit the WhatsApp feedback of some friends who joined today, like, like Khaled before, which is, uh, uh, which is here. The, okay, the, I don't end the meeting. I'll just keep you there and speak to let the... Let it run. Let it run. You are in charge to stop it. 
<laughs> I just I just leave when I have enough. <laughs> ट <laughs> So I think we had a good time together and I will end this meeting with my greeting. Happy to meet, sorry to part, happy to meet again. See you soon again. Yes.